All right, welcome back everybody. Uh, today we're going to wrap up the 14th week of class and we're going to just jump right back into this lecture on momentum. So originally I said we were going to have a quiz at the beginning of class today, but um, the pace of this lecture is going to be a little slow and uh, I want to make sure we get through all of it. So I'm going to have the quiz be a take-home quiz. Just get a copy at the front of the room. This is going to be due next time you come to class, which is Tuesday. So it'll be due at the same time as the next homework assignment, okay? Any questions on that? Okay, hopefully you're happy about that. So let's get into the next slide. We just talked about conservation of momentum. We actually derived it. I showed you why it holds true and under what circumstances it holds true. Remember the idea was, if you have some system, the system can contain many different moving objects, but if there's no net external force on that system, that is, if you add up all the outside forces acting on the system and you get zero, then momentum is conserved. Okay, that's the idea behind conservation of momentum. It holds under the condition that there's zero outside force acting on your system. So let's take this idea and apply it to the simplest possible case, which is your system is just one object moving along, okay? If that's the case, then we have our object with some kind of mass and some kind of velocity, and we're supposing that there's no outside force acting on it. You might imagine something like this spaceship, which is just flying through the depths of empty space far away from anything that could be exerting a force on it, okay? If that's the case, its momentum is conserved. It's constant over time. Well, that's a pretty simple idea because what that boils down to, if you just have a single object, is that the velocity is constant over time. Because momentum is just mass times velocity. Of course, the mass won't be changing in this situation. It means the velocity must not be changing, right? So the idea is, you have no outside force, your velocity is not changing. This is basically just Newton's first law, if you think way, way back to that chapter, chapter 5. Remember, Newton's first law says an object will move at constant velocity unless it is acted upon by an unbalanced force. All right, so if you just have one object, conservation of momentum basically just boils down to the first law. But again, it's more general than that, because as we're about to find out, we can use conservation of momentum in cases where there's more than just one object involved. For example, a collision between two objects. That's what we'll start to get into now. So, before we get into any examples where we make calculations, I just really want to touch home on this point about defining a system, okay? Because this might be something new to you. Uh, it hasn't really come up in the class yet. So the idea is, conservation of momentum only applies when there is zero external force acting on a system. So if you're going to use this idea, if you're going to solve a problem using conservation of momentum, you have to be very careful and be clear about what your system is, okay? You have to define what's in your system, what's not in your system. Uh, that's the only way it's really gonna work out. So I'm gonna give you an example. It's a really simple case, a so-called two-body collision. In this case, we have two pool balls on a pool table and they bump into each other, okay? And in this case, we'll say that the 12 ball is moving towards the 11 ball at first and the 11 ball is at rest on the table to start off. But then the 12 ball knocks into the 11 ball, and after that collision, the 12 ball comes to a stop, and then the 11 ball moves on like this. You've probably seen something like that happen if you've ever played pool before, right? Okay, so there, there's more than one way we could define our system, right? I could say my system is just ball 12, maybe just ball 11, or I could say my system is both. And I have to be careful about which one I'm choosing. Let's take, in our first example, the system just to be the 11 ball. It should be pretty obvious if, if we're just looking at that system alone, momentum is not conserved in this collision because, okay, before the collision, the 11 ball was at rest. It had zero momentum, correct? And then after the collision, it's moving on this way, it has some momentum now. So if, if it just gains some momentum, then momentum must not have been conserved. 
for the 11 ball alone, right? But if you take a wider view, and you say, I want to define my system as both of these together, the 11 ball and the 12 ball together, right? Then momentum is concerned. Because basically, the 12 ball had all the momentum to start off, and then it just transferred that to the 11 ball. But the total amount of momentum, if we add it together between the two, is staying the same, okay? So, but that only works if we define the system to be both objects. Does that make sense? By the way, it's pretty clear what the outside force would be if we just define our system to be the 11 ball, right? During this collision, the 12 ball smacks into it. That's an external force, right? But if we think of our system as being both of these together, now that's an internal force. So it doesn't count as far as conservation and momentum is concerned. So um, let me expand on that just a little bit more, okay? We're taking this scenario uh, where there's a collision between two pool balls. So what we're going to do is define the system to be these two pool balls. Everything else is outside, okay? Um, we're also going to assume uh, for simplicity, no friction, no air resistance. We make that assumption a lot, right? So you guys tell me, I mean, what we're going to do is come up with a free body diagram of our system. So like every single force that may be present here during this collision, what would that be? And keep in mind, they're resting on a table. So what forces would we kind of identify right off the bat? Yeah, so each one would have a normal force from the table going up, assuming it's a flat table, and uh, the weight going down, okay? So here, I'll call this WE2. It's the weight that's exerted by the earth on the 12 ball. I'm gonna just call that two for simplicity, okay? Uh, what else do I have? Well, check this out. The two balls are colliding with each other. They're exerting forces on one another. And if you can kind of imagine what it looks like when they're bumped up right against each other, this ball is feeling a force going to the left due to this ball. And using our notation with double subscripts, that's F12. This is the force that the 11 ball exerts on the 12 ball going this way, okay? What else do we have? We have that normal force we just talked about. The, the 12 ball experiences a normal force going straight up from the table. So we, we say NT2. Okay, the 11 ball, that has a weight. So there's gravity acting on that. We call that WE1. It's acting on the 11 ball. There is a normal force from the table. That's also there. But we should also take note of the fact that if they're touching each other, they exert equal and opposite forces on one another. So we have F21. This is the force that this ball exerts on this ball. Okay, so I'll put a little hash mark on each one of these to denote equal and opposite forces. So you guys tell me, if, if we're thinking um, internal versus external forces, out of all of these I labeled, which ones would be my internal forces? Well, that wouldn't qualify here because the system is just the two pool balls, right? It's internal if it's a force that the pool balls are exerting on each other. If it's coming from something outside, like the table, then that's an external force, right? So actually, it turns out the two normal forces, those are external, because those are coming from the table. And then the two weight or gravitational forces, also external, because those are coming from the Earth. It's these two which are internal, because it's forces between two objects in your system. Okay? That makes sense? So let's label. Internal forces are F12, F21. External forces, everything else. Remember, what has to be true for momentum to be conserved? It's the external forces have to add up to zero, okay? Is that the case? If I added up all of these forces, would they give me zero? 
Yeah, right? Because, you know, this normal force is canceled by the weight. This normal force is canceled by this weight. So, yeah, if we add them together, which is, again, the two normal forces plus the two weights added together, we get complete cancellation. So that the net external force, the total outside force, is zero, okay? So the takeaway point here is, the total outside force, the net external force acting on this system is zero. So therefore, we can apply conservation of momentum to it, okay? That makes sense? It's only under those conditions that we can apply conservation of momentum. And by the way, if there were friction or air resistance, that would change the picture a little bit, right? But typically in collisions, we will ignore friction and air resistance so that you can assume momentum is conserved between the colliding bodies, okay? If you add up everything, it should be conserved. All right, so the type of collision we're gonna see most often is a two-body collision, okay? Just two objects colliding. Um, the example I just gave you was a two-body collision. So the generic way I'm gonna label things just to kind of set up the equations is like this. We have two objects, they can be whatever you want. They could be two hockey pucks sliding on some ice. They could be two billiard balls, two cars, whatever you like. Two football players tackling, one tackling the other. It's a two body collision, right? And we'll just label the objects A and B. All right. What we have is a comparison between the before state, the initial state, before the collision actually happened, and then the after state, the final state after the collision happens. So what we want to do is set the momentum initial equal to the momentum final. That's how we can say momentum is conserved. It's not changing between the initial and the final picture, okay? So we need a way of labeling things. Um, and the way that I'm going to do it is like this. Initial velocities before the objects collide, I'm just going to call those VA and VB. And then the final velocities after the collision occurs, and now they're moving off in different directions, I'm gonna use a prime notation for that. So this is VA prime and VB prime. And just remember, we're talking velocities here. These are vectors, we have to keep track of that. So we're gonna assume that there is zero net external force on the system, uh, which is our two colliding bodies. That's our system. If that's the case, the total momentum of the two objects is going to be conserved, okay? So here's how that's going to look, right? I have P initial, the total momentum of the two objects in the initial state, that's when they're coming towards each other before they collided, equals P final, the total momentum of the two objects in the final state after they've collided and they're moving off in new directions, okay? So let's expand that out. For initial, I need to include the momentum of both objects. Remember, momentum is given by mass times velocity. So I have MAVA, and then I have to add to that MBVB. That's the two initial momentums, momenta added together, okay? And then I have MAVA prime plus MBVB prime. Those are the two final momenta added together. So that's how we apply this idea in the case of a two-body collision, okay? Any questions on that? Hopefully pretty straightforward. And okay. The, motion, the, the prime part of it is just identify it or is it because you're taking the derivative of it? Yeah, yeah, so good. Sometimes prime notation is used in different ways. Um, I'm not trying to say it's a derivative. Prime here just means final, okay? That's just the notation I'm using. I think it's also used in the book. It's a pretty common notation. So without the primes, that just means initial. With the primes, that means final. The reason for that is you can just start having way too many subscripts if you put in, like subscript I or subscript F. Because, uh, well, you'll, you'll see in a bit, but that, that's the reason for that. Okay. So now let's get to our first example of a two-body collision. And to make it simple to start off, and then we can kind of build up the complexity, let's imagine that this collision is one-dimensional, meaning before the collision and after the collision, all of the motion is happening along a line, okay? 
one dimensional motion. Uh, and here's what's going on. You have two hockey pucks, mass one. Uh, this hockey puck is 45 grams, okay? Um, and then mass two, this hockey puck is 35 grams. What we see is that they're on a level and frictionless hockey table. Okay, so they can slide around the table with no friction. We see puck number one here is initially at rest. And puck number two is coming directly towards it with a speed of 2.45 meters per second. The pucks collide head on. So that head on means they just continue in that same direction rather than getting scattered at some angle, right? So they collide head on. And after the collision, we see puck two has slowed down a bit. Now it's only moving forward at 1.05 meters per second. The question is, what is the final speed of puck number one here. That's what we want to find out. Okay, so basically what, what do we do? We say the total momentum in this situation is equal to the total momentum in this situation because during the collision there wasn't any outside force acting on our system. Okay, all right, so we all clear on the, uh, the setup here. Let's, let's work it out then. Okay, so here's what we're doing. We're saying the system in question is puck one plus puck two. Remember, just be careful about how you define your system. It's pretty clear it's a two-body collision. That makes sense. That would be our system. But what we see is because there's no friction on the table and the table's perfectly flat, there's no external force overall acting on our system. I showed you in an example why that's the case, right? So therefore, if we have zero net external force on our system, that means that the momentum of our system is conserved. Okay, so now I know because of this fact, I can use conservation of momentum. So I have P initial equals P final. All right, well, I'm labeling things one and two as opposed to A and B, but it's the same as before, right? I have M1, V1, okay, that's the initial momentum of puck one, plus M2, V2, that's the initial momentum of puck two, and I have that equaling M1, V1 prime, and then uh, add to that M2, V2 prime. Okay, so that's the statement of conservation of the momentum. But I can simplify this a little bit already because here, V1, that's the initial velocity of puck one. That was the one that started off at rest. So I could just cross that term off. It's equal to zero because we start from rest for that particular puck. All right, what am I trying to find? V1 prime, I'm trying to find the final velocity of puck number one. So here's what I have. I have M1 V1 prime. I'm just gonna try to isolate that term by subtracting this term right here. So I have M2 V2 minus M2 V2 prime. And then to solve for V1 prime, I'm just gonna divide out M1. So V2 prime is equal to M2 divided by M1 times V2 minus V2 prime, just to simplify the expression a little bit, okay? So we clear on how I got to this point. Now let's just plug in the numbers. In this problem, the mass of puck two was 35 grams. And the mass of puck one was 45 grams, so that's the, the ratio right there. V2, remember, there's no prime on that, so that means initial. Initially, this puck was moving at 2.45 meters per second to the right. Let's call that the x direction. Let's call that, you know, 2.45 meters per second i hat for motion this way. That's usually what we use as our x direction, right? Then, I'm subtracting V2 prime. That's the final velocity for that puck. 
while it was still moving in the what we're calling the x direction, but at a less uh, at a slower speed. So it's 1.05 meters per second i hat, right? Uh, so can someone work that out? It's just 2.45 minus 1.05 times the ratio of these two masses. Yeah, I think, well, I think when you round it, it's like 0 0.9, right? Yeah. So 1.09 meters per second I hat. So it's traveling in the same direction, okay, as all the other motion. So what do we have? Let's look back at the picture. So this one comes in at 2.45 meters per second. It hits puck 1, so it slows down a bit as a result. Now it's moving at 1.05 meters per second, and puck one is moving ahead at 1.09 meters per second. That's what we found, okay? But the total momentum here and here is the same, okay? So let's do another example. Um, let's do an example where the collision occurs, but now we have to consider two-dimensional motion because it's not just a head-on collision. Imagine puck 2 is coming in towards puck 1 just like before. Same exact speed as before, 2.45 meters per second, okay? But rather than hitting it head on, it kind of hits it on the side. In that sense, puck 1 going up this way and puck 2 going down this way. Again, if you've played pool before, you're familiar with this kind of thing. If you want to get a ball to go straight, you just hit it head on. If you want it to go to the side, you hit it from the side, right? All right, so let's say that this one goes off still at 1.05 meters per second in terms of speed, but it's going at an angle of 25 degrees below the horizontal line here, okay? So that's the situation. All right, so um, let's work this one out. This is the two-dimensional version of the previous problem that we did. So a lot of this is just like before. Our system is the two pucks. There isn't any outside force acting on the system. Therefore, momentum of that system in total is conserved. So let's just skip right to that. P initial equals P final for this system. Okay, and just like before, that's M1, V1 plus M2 V2 equals M1 V1 prime plus M2 V2 prime. So just to remind you, it's puck one that starts off at rest. So you can just cross that initial momentum for puck one off the list. And we're trying to solve for V1 prime um, so this is what it works out to. V1 prime equals M2 over M1. So I have to divide out the mass here to isolate V1 prime times V2. So that's this term with the M1 divided out. And remember, I have to subtract off this term to isolate V1 prime. So I have minus M2 over M1 v2 prime. So it's the same algebra as before, right? It's the same exact expression we got before. Nothing so far is different from the previous example, okay? But what does change are how these vectors behave, okay? Before, it was pretty easy to subtract the vectors because they were both just purely in the x direction. Now, we have x and y motions to think about, okay? So I want you to think about this type of coordinate system, by the way. X is going to the right, Y is going like this. So let's try doing this. Let's try just writing down this entire vector on one line 
and then this entire vector on the next line, both of them should be in xy form, and then we can subtract them just like any other vectors we subtract. So here I have m2 over m1, that's 35 grams for m2, and 45 grams for m1. And then that's going to be multiplied by v2. What's v2? That's the initial velocity of puck 2. Remember, that was moving purely in the x direction at 2.45 meters per second. So here's what I'll say. I'll say 2.45 meters per second i hat, and then just 0 j hat, because initially puck 2 has no velocity in the y direction. Okay? It's only after the collision, which is the prime velocity, where there's an x and a y component to think about. So I'm going to subtract this guy, which is m2 over m1, same ratio, 35 over 45. And now I'm going to write v2 prime. That was the final velocity of puck 2, and I'm going to write it in xy form. Okay? So let's remember a few things. The speed of the puck, that would be the magnitude of this velocity, was 1.05 meters per second. The direction it was traveling was in the fourth quadrant like this, at, uh, let's say, negative 25 degrees. Because if I'm going below the x-axis, I could consider that to be a negative angle. So here's how I'd write the uh, x and y components. For the x component, I'd have 1.05 meters per second, and then cosine of negative 25 degrees. That's my x component, so it gets an i hat. And then we have 1.05 meters per second. And then sine of negative 25 degrees times j hat. So that's v2 prime in xy form right there. So what we're going to do is find the resultant vector we get when we subtract all this. So what am I punching in the calculator? I have 35 over 45 times 2.45 minus 35 over 45 times this, 1.05 cosine negative 25. Okay, because we take the x components together, right? Just go down the column, all right? So I'll tell you what that works out to. It's 1.165 meters per second with three sig figs on it, okay? So if you you crunch all the x components, that's what you get. Now for the y components, that's easier because you have just 0 and then minus 35 over 45 times 1.05 sine negative 25 degrees. Can someone tell me what that y component works out to? So it's, it's actually going to be positive because I have a negative sign here and my angle has a negative inside of it so those will end up canceling. So it's positive uh, 0.345 and then the next digit is 1 but we keep 3 sig figs on that meters per second j hat. Okay? So again if we think about the primed velocities we have V1 prime going off in the first quadrant like this, it has positive x and y components. And then we have V2 prime going off in the fourth quadrant like this. Okay, so the one we found just now is this one in the first quadrant. All right, so to finish this off, we want to find the speed of this puck and its direction of motion. So I have the velocity written in xy form. I want the speed, that's just the magnitude of this velocity. Okay, so the magnitude of this velocity is given by what? How do I calculate it? Okay. 
take yeah, take the radical square root of what? The i hat square and the j hat square. Yep. It's just like any other vector, right? I have it in xy form. I'm trying to express it in terms of the magnitude. So I use the Pythagorean theorem. That's square root 1.65 meters per second square plus 0 0.345 meters per second. And we square that. And what do we end up with as our answer? Uh, yeah, I'm getting 1.22 meters per second. So that's how fast it's moving, 1.22 meters per second. Now, last question. If I have the x and y components, how do I get the angle of this vector? Because you can see v1 is kind of going off this way. I'm interested in what angle is it moving at relative to the x-axis. It's an inverse tangent, yeah? So if I want the angle, I'll call that theta 1 prime, so it's the angle of this final velocity. That's going to be tangent inverse of what exactly? J over the hat. Yep, the y component over the x component. So it's point 0.3451 over 1.165. And the units just cancel, so I'm just going to leave them off, okay? And what does that work out to? Uh, you might be in radiance mode. Yeah, it's like 16.5 degrees. So there it is. This first ball, after the collision, is going off at a speed of 1.22 meters per second at an angle of 16.5 degrees. So it doesn't really come down to anything different than vector addition, which you know we haven't really used it in this form in a little while, but we've covered this before. So we apply conservation of momentum to the colliding objects. We solve for some kind of unknown velocity, typically, and that just comes down to being able to add and subtract vectors, okay? So, any questions on this example? Sure. Yeah, I have one question. Yeah. It's fine we're using ground theorem, not the code theorem? Yeah, because that just dropped out. Oh, okay. No yeah. Right. Yeah, so you just get a number with no units, so that's why I didn't uh, bother with it. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, in other cases, you might worry about that. But if it's just a ratio of two quantities, um, two similar quantities, like mass over mass, you don't have to worry about the units, as long as they're consistent. OK, so next, um, it's kind of a follow-up question. Uh, all right, so we're. In the last two problems, where we imagine these sliding pucks, like on an air hockey table, um, we imagine the table itself is perfectly level. Okay, that's that's usually how it is with an air hockey table. But what if it were tilted and not level? Could we still say that the momentum, the total momentum of the two pucks, is conserved in that case? So I mean, so imagine we still let them collide, like. Just chuck one towards the other, let them collide. You know, see how they move off. Is momentum still conserved? Who, who thinks yes in this case? Who thinks no? All right. So you got it right. Um, can you kind of think of the reason why? Yeah. Now gravity is not just balanced out by your normal force, which would be the case if you're on a level table, right? Now, if you add up the outside forces, you don't just get zero, which means momentum is not conserved. Uh, it's actually increasing as they slide down. They're going to pick up momentum because gravity is going to be accelerating them, right? So let's do the... Um, Kind of picture of the forces. We've seen this before, right? We have two bodies colliding on a table with no friction, no air resistance. 
Each one has a weight. Uh, so let's call this one WB2. When they hit each other, they exert forces on one another. So this one will exert a force F12 on the second puck. Right? It's going to be directed this way. If you think about how they would exert forces when they touch. And of course, this one has a normal force from the table, but because the table is tilted, that's going off at some angle now. Okay? And the force diagram for number one looks kind of similar, the weight straight down. There's a force uh, due to the collision, so that's F21. This is puck two exerting a force on puck one. And then we have the normal force from the table acting on that one. So remember, the idea is our system is the two pucks together. And now um, we can't say anymore that we have zero external force, okay? Because when we add up all of these external forces, these two normal forces, these two weights, remember those are the outside forces in this situation, uh, clearly we don't get total cancellation like we did before. We actually get something that is pointing down the ramp, okay? So you have a net external force going down the ramp. So anyway, that's just an example where Conservation of momentum is no longer going to hold, so hopefully that's pretty straightforward. Any questions about that? Okay. So yeah, I'm not sure if I'm beating this point to death or if we're getting it, but uh, let's move on. Um, here's one for you to try. Okay, classic example is this sort of train car collision, where you have a bunch of train cars coupled together, okay? And you could couple five train cars together and have that move as a single object. Or you could just have a single train car moving. Any kind of combination of things. But the point is, on the train tracks, there is a collision. Okay? And in this case, we're going to imagine that after collision, the cars hitch together. So here's what's going on. This train car, initially traveling at 40 meters per second, approaches three identical train cars which are initially at rest and all coupled together. When this train car hits the other three, they hitch together so that now they're all moving off together. What is that final speed for the four train cars moving off all together? Yeah, some of you could probably just see it, but just as a way of training how you set up more complex problems, just try writing it out from the beginning. Try writing out the total momentum of your system before and after, and seeing how that answer pops out, okay? So this is a one-dimensional case. Everything's happening just along the x-axis, so the math is a little simpler. So yeah, for this one, just go ahead and assume momentum is conserved. You don't have to you know, go through that proof again. Actually, for this one, let me just, because there's a follow-up to this question coming next, um, let me just suggest a, a way to set this up, okay? Um, so, if we're looking at the before picture, before the collision, you know, we don't know the mass 
of any individual train car, but we do know that all the train cars are identical. So they all have the same mass. So what we could say is this, we could say, have mass M coming this way with velocity V towards mass 3M over here, that's the three coupled train cars, which are initially at rest. Then my after picture is I have mass 4M, now everything's just moving together as one object with velocity V prime. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the momentum before and after is the same. P initial equals P final. Okay, so initially, what do I have? I just have M times V for that uh, incoming train car, and then plus zero for the stationary cars. They don't have any momentum. What does that equal? 4M V prime. So mass cancels, of course. V prime is a quarter of V. So if V, the incoming velocity was 40 meters per second, I hat, just we'll call I hat motion to the right. That's how we get 10 meters per second. Okay, and that might be just way too much detail. Like again, a lot of you just immediately saw it's 10. Um, so a more kind of straight to the point way to explain this would be, look, momentum stayed the same. Mass went up by a factor of four. You've quadrupled your mass, right? To keep momentum the same, what do you have to do? You have to decrease your velocity by a factor of four, right? But anyway, for more complex problems, you really need to set it up like this uh, because you won't be able to just kind of do it in your head. So with that said, check out this follow-up. Um, so same initial situation. There's a train car traveling at 40 meters per second, and it's uh, approaching these three identical coupled train cars, which are initially at rest. But instead of hitching to them, and, and it just sticks, and everything moves as one object at the end, it bounces off, okay? So this train car, which was initially coming in, is now bouncing off, moving in the opposite direction at 20 meters per second. So these three, we imagine, should be moving forward at some, uh, at some velocity after this. But what is that velocity? Okay. So again, take the initial picture and the final picture, set the total momenta equal to each other. Same mass, but we got three of them, and we'll just call that 3M. Mm -hmm. So I still find the M drops out if you uh, set up the equation.
very close, but what about the sign that happened? So don't forget, whenever you see a V in your momentum equation, it's a vector, so the direction has to be accounted for. We're just in one dimension, so you can account for direction with either a positive sign or a negative sign. So I see some people are getting the answer now. Um, if you're still working on it, that's okay. Just want to plug ahead here. So uh, let's draw the picture once again. It's a slightly different scenario now. The before picture is still the same. You have one train car, so we'll just call that mass m, coming in with velocity v. And then you've got these three train cars with combined mass 3m just sitting there stationary. Now the after picture is different because instead of hitching together and all moving as one, now uh, there's sort of a bounce or a ricochet back. So we have this train car mass m. It's now moving uh, to the left. Let's call that velocity v1 prime, okay? And then these three train cars all moving together in the opposite direction, let's say they have velocity v2 prime. Okay, so just to distinguish the two, I'm going to label them one and two. All right? So here's how conservation of momentum works. We have p initial equals p final. And that tells us that mv that's the initial momentum of that incoming car. And then just say plus zero because this has no momentum to it. That equals m times v1 prime plus 3m times v2 prime. So notice the mass drops out across the board. And by the way, I'm trying to find this one right here, v2 prime. I know V1 prime is 20 meters per second going to the left. Okay, so if I solve for V2 prime, I'm going to get 3 V2 prime equals this V minus V1 prime. So just divide out 3, and we'll get V2 prime is a third. Um, V minus V1 prime, okay? So now we can just plug in everything we know, but we have to be careful. See, V, that's the incoming velocity of the, the first train car. So that's uh, 40 meters per second I have, right? And then I'm subtracting V1 prime. That's this one going in the negative x direction. So its velocity is negative 20 meters per second times i hat. So you don't want to do 40 minus 20 here. You, don't, you want to do 40 minus negative 20. Okay? Make sense? All right, so that actually works out to a nice clean answer of 20 meters per second i hat. So after the bounce, uh, they each move off in opposite directions at the same speed of 20 meters per second. So any questions on that one? All right, so we've seen some two-body collision examples. Now um, we're going to look at a slightly different example, but it really utilizes the same physics, okay? So here we have a bomb, and initially the bomb is just in one solid piece, and it's at rest. But the bomb goes off, it explodes. And let's say it goes into three fragments, so it splits into three chunks, okay? 
Immediately after the explosion, one of those chunks, which is 25% of the total mass of the bomb, is traveling due north at 250 meters per second. So you have one just traveling like this. Let's say you have another fragment, which is half, 50% of the bomb's total mass, traveling in a direction 35 degrees south of west at 350 meters per second. Okay, so basically the bomb goes off, splits into three parts. We know the velocity of two of those parts. So the third part, the remaining part, what is the velocity of that? Okay, so we're going to, of course, answer the question what the velocity is, but we're going to give it as a magnitude. So how fast is it traveling off? And in what direction is it traveling off? Okay, so first of all, let's think about whether we can use conservation of momentum here. Okay, this is our system, this one exploding object. Okay, and during that explosion, we're going to assume there's no external force acting on it. Okay, of course, there's a huge internal force blowing the thing apart, but as far as outside forces, not really present. Okay, so therefore, we can assume that the total momentum is conserved. What was the total momentum at the very start before it exploded? It was zero, right? Because you have just one mass sitting there, not moving. So it must be that the total momentum at the end is zero. In other words, if you add up the momentum vectors of all of the outgoing fragments, they have to cancel out and give you zero. That makes sense? So the momentum vectors of the outgoing fragments all add up to zero. That's what we're dealing with. Okay, so here we go. Let's... Uh, Draw the picture. And we'll just start with the fact that before explosion, we already know that P initial can be written this way. It's just the total mass of the bomb times the initial velocity, but it's at rest, so we put in zero. So we get zero momentum to start off. It's at rest. Okay? Okay, after explosion. Now we have these three pieces, okay? And one of those pieces, the first one that was mentioned, is going due north. So I'm gonna show its velocity vector. I'm gonna call it V1, it's pointing due north. Remember this piece was 25% of the total mass, or a quarter. I'll just write a quarter big M, for that's one fourth of the total mass, okay? All right, we have a second piece. The second one that was mentioned, it's half of the total mass. 50% of the total mass. This piece was going at um, 35 degrees south of west. So that's like this, if you recall. Let's actually draw the coordinates real quick, just so we remember. Directions on the map, we usually use X for east and then y for north, like this. So a vector going 35 degrees south of east looks like this. Okay, because you, or, sorry, south of west. South of west. You start west like this, you go 35 degrees down, that's your vector, okay? And we're calling that one v2. All right, so the idea here is we have some third fragment. What's the mass of that last piece? It's a, yeah, it's got to be a quarter, right? Because you have to add up to the mass you started with. So you have a quarter of the mass. I'm not really sure which way it's going. You know, vaguely I can say it's going that way because um, we know the momentum vectors out will have to cancel each other out. But uh, I can't really say anything too specific. We're going to find out what that v3 is actually equal to, and that's the whole point of this problem, is to find v3. So after explosion, p final, the combined momentum of all of these pieces is like this. It's a quarter big M times v1. Okay, that's the momentum of the, the first piece. 
And then we have half of big M times V2. And then we have a quarter of big M times V3. That's the total momentum of these three pieces. But what we want to say is that momentum is conserved during the explosion. So P initial equals P final. What does that say? That says zero, that's our initial momentum, equals P final. That's this whole thing, which I'll write again as a quarter MV1 plus a half MV2 plus a quarter MV3. So notice what I can do. Big M represents the total mass. I can just divide that out, can't I? And it just goes away. So it really doesn't matter. We don't know what the total mass is. We don't need to know that to solve for what we want to solve for here, okay? All right, so I'm trying to find V3. So I have a quarter times V3. And I'm trying to isolate V3, so let's subtract these two. So I have minus a quarter V1, and then minus a half V2. So if I'm finding V3, I better multiply by four. So then I have minus V1, and then minus two V2. Okay, does that make sense? Math checks out. So now we're at a stage where we're just adding or subtracting vectors, okay? That means I need to look at each one of these vectors and express them in xy form. Let's start with vector one. That one's pretty simple. So here we go. We have v3 equals minus vector one. That's the one that's going straight north. What can I say about the x component for v1? It's zero. It only has a y component because it's only moving along the y-axis. So I'll write this as zero i hat. And then um, what's the uh, y component? This one was moving due north at 250 meters per second. So I'll put 250 meters per second j hat like this. Okay, so that's minus v1. Then I have minus 2 times v2. Now for this guy, um, I have to kind of break it down a little bit, okay? So if I have 35 degrees like south of west, what would my angle be uh, for v2 off of the positive x-axis, like going from the x-axis to where this is? Yeah, so we'd want to add 180 to the 35 degrees, giving 215. And the reason for that is, um, you know, uh, when we break vectors down into sine and cosine, okay, you can associate cosine with your x component, and you can associate sine with your y component, as long as your angle is defined in the proper way, okay? So that's why we did that. So, all right, V2, we're going to write that vector down now. We have 350 meters per second as the magnitude. And then I'm going to write cosine 215 degrees to get the x component of that vector. And then I'm going to say 350 meters per second times sine of 215 degrees to give me the y component of the same vector, okay? And then what I'll do is I'll find the resultant, okay? So for my resultant vector, the x component is what I get when I do zero minus two times 350 times cosine 215, okay? And um, what that works out to if you punch the numbers in, is 573.4 meters per second, okay? If I want to get the y component, what I'm doing is minus 250 
and then minus 2 times 350 times sine of 215 degrees, subtracting down the columns. If you crunch those numbers, you get 151.5 meters per second. Okay, so that's the x and y components of that third velocity vector. And notice we're in the first quadrant, so we're actually kind of moving more this way. Okay? So, what's the magnitude of this velocity? What's the speed of that third fragment? Well, that's going to be the square root of this squared plus that squared. 573, 573.4 meters per second squared plus 151.5 meters per second squared that. And I end up with, it's going to work out to 593. That's how fast that third fragment is moving, 593 meters per second. As for the angle, we know how to deal with that. It's the tangent inverse of the y component, 151.5 divided by the x component, 573.4. If you crunch those numbers, you get 14.8 degrees. And we can say north of east because we're in the first quadrant. North of east means you start here facing east. You go 14.8 degrees above that, and that's the direction we're moving in, okay? So that's how you do this one. You can use conservation of momentum not just for collisions, but also for explosions, okay? All right, uh, any questions on that? All right, good. So let's make a little bit more headway. Um, we've talked about collisions and how momentum is conserved during collisions, but it turns out there's more than one type of collision. We can kind of classify collisions in various ways. Okay, and the basic classification we're going to use is elastic versus inelastic collisions. And in order to actually understand the difference, we're going to need to introduce a new quantity, which you've probably heard about before, called energy. Okay? We've all heard this word, but it actually means something very specific in physics. Um, in physics, energy is maybe the most important conserved quantity that you'll, you'll find. Okay? So just like momentum is a conserved quantity, so is energy. And the idea with energy is that it can take on many different forms. But when you add up the total energy of all of the components in the universe, you'll find that it always stays the same, okay? So energy can be given from one object to another, you can transfer energy from one place to another, or you can convert energy from one type to another, but the point is the sum total is a conserved quantity. So I'm just gonna rattle off some examples here. We have kinetic energy, there's something called elastic potential energy, that's the energy that's stored when I like stretch a band, stretch a rubber band like this, okay? Uh, we have gravitational potential energy. That's the idea that if you lift something up to a, a height, it has some potential energy, meaning if I drop it, that can be converted to energy of motion, kinetic energy. It's also nuclear energy. These are just some examples. For now, we're just gonna only need to focus on kinetic energy. Okay, when you take physics 45, you're going to learn about these other types. All right? But for now, we're just thinking about kinetic energy. So let's define kinetic energy. Energy, kinetic energy, is the energy associated with motion. Okay? It's the energy something has because of the fact that it's moving in a certain way. That's kinetic energy. And there's a definition. It's pretty simple. It's one half mv squared. So this looks a lot like momentum, right? Because it's some formula that only involves m and v. But you want to be careful. In the case of momentum, v is a velocity. It's a vector, so it has a direction to it, okay? Kinetic energy is not a vector. It's just a scalar quantity. There's no direction that's associated with it, okay? So when you see v in this equation, there's not the little vector arrow above it. 
That means it's a speed, okay? It's not a velocity, it's just a speed, um, which is a scalar quantity. So kinetic energy given by capital K is one half mv squared, uh, where again, v is the speed, m is the mass. So right away, because um, we're dealing with a new type of quantity, we have a new unit associated with it. Um, the SI unit for energy is a joule. So let me show you real quick how the units work out, okay? If energy is basically a mass times the speed squared, that means the units should be kilograms times speed units, which are meters per second, all squared, okay? So um, take it all together, we can kind of combine those as kilograms times meters squared divided by seconds squared like this, okay? And that is what we call a joule. That's the definition of a joule. Kind of reminds you of Newton's, if you look at it, right? With Newton's, it's a kilogram meter per second squared. For a joule, it's a kilogram meter squared per second squared, okay? So just an extra factor of meters on top is what distinguishes that from Newton's. All right, so let's do a few examples real quick, okay? Just calculating kinetic energy, just working with this new formula. My first example is how much kinetic energy does a 4.2 gram bullet have if it's moving at 965 meters per second, okay? Second example, how much kinetic energy does a 125 kilogram linebacker traveling at a speed of 6.5 meters per second have? So for each of these, we're just doing one half mv squared, and let's get to it. Okay, so for the bullet, the mass is 4.20 grams, but right away, I know I wanna change those units to kilograms, because to get it to work out for the energy in units of joules, I need this to be in kilograms. So how do I do that unit conversion? If I'm trying to go from grams to kilograms, <clears throat> what, I'm dividing by a thousand, right? In one kilogram, I have a thousand grams. So this is 4.20, 10 to the minus three kilograms. Dividing by a thousand is the same as multiplying by 10 to the minus three. Okay, and we have the speed, so we can just go ahead and do this. Kinetic energy is a half times 4.20, 10 to the minus three kilograms. And we're imagining this is moving at 965 meters per second, and we're gonna square that speed right there. Can someone work this out? Did you account for the one half? I did not. So yeah. If you guys do this, so follow along, this is 1,960. And the units are kilograms, meters squared per second squared, okay? In kilograms, we square the meters, we square the seconds. But we remember this is a joule. So 1,960 joules. Okay, for the linebacker, same, uh, same formula is being used here. Kinetic energy is a half times the mass. The mass we were given is 125 kilograms. And the speed, 6.5 meters per second, which we square. So the units work out just like before in joules. So what do we get? 2,640 joules. Okay, so same order of magnitude, but slightly more for the linebacker. Okay, 
So that's just how you make those types of calculations pretty straightforward, okay? But it turns out this is going to be a really important quantity when it comes to collisions. Because there are different ways a collision can go down. Okay, in some cases, you collide two objects together, and after they go their separate ways, they have the same kinetic energy that they came in with. Okay, in other cases, they can lose some of that kinetic energy. Okay, so let's take a look at three examples. Okay, we have two one kilogram masses, which we're going to label as A and B. They're initially sliding directly towards each other on a flat and frictionless surface. Let's say each one is coming in with a speed of one meter per second. So let's take a look at this first example as a possible way they can move off after colliding. Let's say they bounce off each other and they're moving just as fast as when they came in, so one meter per second. This is what that would look like, okay? Take a look at the animation. So you have A and B approaching. They bounce off and they don't lose any of their speed. Okay? So first of all, just based on that you know, animation, does it look like momentum was conserved? Yeah. So if, if we look at the initial picture, you have two masses uh, traveling in opposite directions. They have the same mass, one kilogram, and they're moving at the same speed but the directions oppose each other. So what can we say about the way those two momentum vectors add together? Yeah, so the incoming objects, their momentum vectors cancel each other out. So the total is zero, right? When they move off their separate ways, what is it? They still cancel, right? Because they're still moving equally fast in opposite directions with equal mass. So momentum is conserved. In fact, zero momentum is the total, right? And it stays that way before and after. But notice how kinetic energy is also conserved. No kinetic energy was lost. Okay? Um, let's just run through that calculation real quick. It's probably easy to do in your head, but let me show you what I'm kind of having in mind here. Okay, so in this first example, what do we have? Let's call this kinetic energy initial. That's going to be a half times ma times va squared, because m, one half mv squared is kinetic energy. And then I have to add that to one half mv vb squared. Okay? So I'm going to add a half times a kilogram times a meter per second, which we square. So that's the mass of A and the speed of A coming in. And then I'm going to have a half times a kilogram times a meter per second, which I square, which is the mass and the speed of B. So this works out to just one joule. Okay? So initially, combined kinetic energy of the two masses is just one joule. So remember, momentum is a vector, so the momentums can cancel out. Kinetic energy is not like that, it's not a vector, so they just add together, they don't cancel in any sort of way. All right, so what about the final? That's going to be a half ma va prime squared. So I'm going to use the final speed of puck a and square it. And then I'm going to have a half mb vb prime squared. So that's just the total kinetic energy in the final state, okay? But the speeds haven't changed, and the masses haven't changed, so when you plug in the numbers, it's the same thing as before. You get one joule. So there's no change. There's no change in kinetic energy. Final minus initial kinetic energy, call that delta K, is zero. No change. Okay. So that makes sense. Let's look at this second example. So now the masses come in, they bounce off each other, and they move off in opposite directions, but now at half a meter per second as they move their separate ways, okay? So momentum is still conserved. You still have 
the incoming momentum vectors canceling, and then the outgoing momentum vectors canceling. But the kinetic energy is not the same as before, okay? Clearly, we've lost some amount of kinetic energy in this collision. So we can calculate just how much, okay? So in this second example, it's our final kinetic energy, which is different now. Let's, let's crunch the numbers. We have a half times one kilogram times, now it's half a meter per second, which we square. That's for A. And then for B, we have a half times a kilogram times half of a meter per second, which we square. That's kinetic energy for B in the final state. What does this work out to? So half squared is a quarter times a half is an eighth. This one is also an eighth, so an eighth plus an eighth is a quarter. 0.25 joules, right? So in this second example, there's a change in kinetic energy, right? If we do final minus initial, we have 0.25 joules in total in our final state, minus one joule in our initial. So the change is minus 0.75 joules. We've lost, in other words, 0.75 joules of kinetic energy in that example, okay? So, do you trust the numbers? Makes sense? Let's do this last one. Now let's imagine a situation where the masses just stick together and they both come to a stop after they collide. Just like that. So here's what it looks like. A approaches B and they just stop when they hit each other, okay? So what's the final kinetic energy in this scenario? Zero. It's zero, right? So you lose all of the initial kinetic energy, right? Okay, we started off with one joule of kinetic energy when they were coming in, but all of that is now gone because nothing is moving. So what is this at the top when they bounced off and same kinetic energy in as kinetic energy out? That's called an elastic collision. This one down here is called a perfectly inelastic collision when they stick together and all the kinetic energy gets lost, okay? So the final outcome of a collision is gonna depend not only on the fact that momentum is conserved, okay? But it's also gonna depend on how much, if any, of that initial kinetic energy is lost, okay? So this defines elastic, inelastic. So elastic, that was the first example I gave you. That means the total kinetic energy of your colliding objects is exactly the same before and after the collision. Inelastic means the objects lose some of their kinetic energy during the collision, okay? And one thing I'll just note before we end here is that even though we lose kinetic energy, we lose energy of motion, energy overall, if we consider all types of energy involved, is actually gonna be conserved. So what that means is, in an inelastic collision, any kinetic energy that's lost is converted to other types of energy, in particular, heat, okay? Colliding two objects together can heat them both up. That's a type of energy. It can also deform the two objects, right? It takes energy to do that. Um, but the point is, kinetic energy, that specific type, is gonna be lost in an inelastic collision. Okay, so we'll talk more about this and some equations associated with elastic, inelastic collisions uh, next week.